ready to get back into our Father's Word here at the chapel. We invite you to get your Bible and join us. We're going to pick it up today, uh, the great book of Judges, chapter 6, verse 25. And in our last lecture, we began the history of our fifth judge of Israel. Uh, that, that I'll specify that as written in the book of Judges. I'll remind you, Moses uh, was spoken of as a judge, and then Eli and Samuel were both smoke, spoken of as judges uh, after the book of Judges history is completed. So, But as far as the book of Judges go, we're on number five. Uh, his name is Gideon. And Gideon was pretty much just a, an average young man. Uh, he made the statement that, you know, he was of the least of the families of Manasseh. Uh, his family was a poor family of Manasseh, and he was the least or the youngest uh, in his house. So, but you may recall in our last lecture, uh, Gibeon was down in a wine press, uh, sunken, uh, hiding from the Midianites, and he's trying to get enough grain together uh, to get a loaf of bread made so that they'll have something to eat. The Midianites uh, uh, and their allies, the Amalekites and the children of the east, uh, probably descendants of Ishmael, uh, were stealing the people of Israel blind. They didn't have anything to eat. Uh, and here uh, the Lord walks up to Gideon and says, calls him a man of valor. And Gideon looks up from the wine press, and I, I know he had to think, uh, are you talking to me? And the Lord went on to say, I'm going to raise you up to deliver the children of Israel. And it's... Uh, 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 an indication that God can utilize uh, whomsoever he chooses uh, to deliver his people. So after seven years of being oppressed uh, by the Midianites and their allies, uh, the people of Israel finally cried out to the Lord and said, uh, help us, and, and God is certainly doing so. Uh, Gideon asked the Lord for a sign that he was, wasn't was dreaming, you know, is this really happening that you're going to lift me up to deliver the Israel from the power of the Midianites? And by consuming that gift and that fire off of the rock, uh, God gave him that miraculous sign. Uh, Gideon, Gideon's not through asking for signs, though, as we'll see in this lecture. So with that uh, update, let's uh, ask that word of wisdom in Yeshua Jesus' precious name, Father, we ask you to open eyes, open ears this day. Uh, Judges chapter 6, verse 25, and it reads, And it came to pass the same night that the Lord said unto him, this being Gideon, Take thy father's young bullock, even the second bullock of seven years old, and throw down the altar, or pull down the altar of Baal that thy father hath and cut down the grove that is by it. Here we have the two principal deities of the Canaanites, Baal and the Ashtaroth, uh, the grove worship. And uh, we see uh, Gideon's name in this, cut down. That's what Gideon means if you translate it, the cutter down. And, you know, this shows how deeply embedded uh, the, the worship of foreign gods, false gods, had become to the Israelites. Gideon's own father had a, an altar to the worship of Baal. Verse 26, the Lord continues his instructions to Gideon. And build an altar unto the Lord thy God upon the top of this rock, no doubt the same rock, that God had instructed Gideon to set his, his offering upon, and then God consumed uh, the sacrifice of Gideon, proving that it had been accepted. In the ordered place, and take the second bullock and offer a burnt uh, sacrifice uh, with a, the wood of the grove which thou shalt cut down, and clean house and sanctify yourself that being the purpose of the burnt offering, uh, it's kind of an approach offering to approach God to sanctify himself to the service of God, and that's what's happening here. I think this is a second 
uh, Bullock. The first Bullock was the one that was seven years old, maybe a little uh, significance of the number seven there, in that that was the equal number of years that the Midianites had brought oppression upon Israel. Now, on the burnt sacrifice, the burnt offering, there is uh, no set age uh, of the livestock according to the law. But again, the purpose of that burnt offering, uh, Gideon presenting himself before the Lord and ready for a life in labor uh, to and for Yahweh. 27. Then Gideon took ten men of his servants and did as the Lord had said unto him. Always good thing to do, obey his command. And so it was because he feared his father's household and the Baal worshipers uh, therein and the men of the city that he could not do it by day, that he did it by night. And this probably the following night after God appeared to him, uh, giving him instruction. And we see in this a little bit of doubt, perhaps, or, or lack of confidence on Gideon's part as far as his own uh, capability and capacity uh, to carry out the wishes of God. Uh, he's waiting until the next night, uh, and then under the cover of darkness, uh, accomplishing what God asked him to do. Uh, some might, you know, when God gives you an instruction, I would like to think that I would march out and say, charge, let's go do it, whether it's day or night. Uh, if God said it, it means we're going to have the victory and we can do it. 28. God will take care of, of Gideon's lack of confidence as we work our way through this lesson. Verse 28, And when the men of the city arose early in the morning, these are the Baal worshipers, behold, the altar of Baal was cast down, and the grove was cut down that was by it, and the second bullock was offered upon the altar that was built. I'll imagine the uh, deacons down at the Baal church went berserk. Who tore down the altar of Baal? Who cut down the ashtrip, the, the groves that we utilize to have our orgies and roll Easter eggs in? And what's this other altar over here? And, and what's left of this burnt offering? It doesn't look like it was offered to Baal. Who was it offered to? 29. And they said one to another, Who hath done this thing? And when they inquired and asked, they said, Gideon, the son of Joash, hath done this thing. Now, how would they know who had done this thing? Well, let's think back on what happened. Gideon, under the cover of darkness, and ten of the servants of his father's household. Aha! I'll bet we've got somebody that rolled over on Gideon out of those ten. Uh, maybe a Baal worshiper himself, or maybe an agnostic that didn't really care about any god. But uh, here more people were uh, against Gideon than for Gideon, so he thinks, well, I'll throw Gideon under the bus. 30. Then the men of the city said unto Joash, this is Gideon's father, Bring out thy son, that he may die because he hath cast down the altar of Baal, and because he hath cut down the grove that was by it. Turn your uh, boy over to us so that we can kill him. He deserves death for tearing down the altar of Baal. Now, I don't know if Gideon's father, Joash, knew at this point that God had instructed Gideon to do this. Uh, certainly Gideon knew that God had instructed him to do it. Verse 31, And Joash said unto all that stood against him, and here he's kind of taking up for his son Gideon, Will ye plead for Baal, or, or will you fight for Baal? Will ye save him? You know, your God should save you, not have it to where you need to save your God. He that will plead for him, let him be put to death, whilst it yet was yet morning. If he be a god, 
let him plead for himself because one hath cast down his altar. And this kind of loses it, these last two phrases. What Joash is telling them is, is it necessary for you to fight for Baal? Is he not capable of fighting for himself? Do you need to save uh, Baal? And if so, if not, then, then give it till tomorrow morning is what they're saying. And if Baal kills my son Gideon, so be it. There is a Baal god. Uh, of course, Gideon knew there was no god Baal, that he was a false god. So uh, Joash uh, uh, stepping up to the plate and, and going to bat for his son and, and making some very good points. You know, if your god Baal is real, why is it necessary for you uh, to take up his cause? 32. Therefore, on that day, he, this is referring to Joash, called him, his son Gideon, Jerubbabel, saying, Let Baal plead against him, because he hath thrown down his altar. Let Baal fight his own battles. Jerubbabel became an honorary title uh, associated with Gideon, and it basically means that uh, he fought or contended with Baal, and Baal could do Gideon no harm. Uh, that indeed was the case. I couldn't help but think about this. You know, there's Baal is a, is a, a, a type for the Antichrist. And there's going to be an altar of Antichrist uh, sitting. It was sitting here. The altar of Baal was sitting where it shouldn't. And that is on Joash, Gideon father's property. Uh, that altar was torn down. There is a, an altar to the Antichrist that will be in the future. Uh, and you know who's going to tear it down? It's going to be our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ when he cleanses Jerusalem. That, that altar of Antichrist is going to be where it should not be. It's going to be in the holy place, uh, and he's going to set himself up to be God in all that is God and above God for that matter. So... I look forward to the day that that altar is torn down because that means our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ has returned and he is going to cleanse Jerusalem. Uh, not one stone will be left standing atop another. Verse 33. Then all the Midianites and the Amalekites and the children of the east were gathered together and went over and pitched in the valley of Jezreel. Now, this they went over indicates to me that uh, there were some who were still on the east side of Jordan. We learned earlier that they were like grasshoppers or locusts for a number, that they and their camels were without number, were on the west side of Jordan. But this shows how uh, porous the border was uh, between uh, the, the east part of Jordan and the west part of Jordan. There was nobody there to meet them I mean, is the point when they crossed Jordan uh, to defend and protect Israel. It was They could come and go uh, as they willed. But here they are gathering the troops for this war that's about to take place. 34. But the Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon and he blew a trumpet, a call to action, a call to war. And Abizar was gathered after him, this being one of the major families of the Manassites. So uh, Gideon called, and the first to answer his call were his own family. Check out this word, came upon Gideon. And many of you with a reference Bible have a reference in your center column that that word means clothed, uh, much like the Spirit of God clothed Gideon, uh, much like we, God's election today, should be clothed with the gospel armor uh, and the Holy Spirit uh, working through us as well. But here we have an average uh, neighborhood kid, Gideon, and the Spirit of God came upon him. So. Uh, that meaning that he's going to judge 
Israel, that means to set things right and rule, shofat in the Hebrew language, the prime of the word judges, shofetum, and tearing down that altar of Baal and cutting down those groves was the first step in setting things right. And, and Gideon is going to be able to get it done now because the Spirit of the Lord hath, has come upon him, has clothed him. 35. And he, Gideon, sent messengers throughout all Manasseh, who also was gathered after him. And he sent messengers unto Asher, and unto Zebulun, and unto Naphtali, and they came up to meet them, the Manassites that were with him already, is the them, in other words. Now, this probably is only the Manassites, the half-tribe on the west side of Jordan. Uh, those on the east side had pretty much kind of separated themselves uh, from the tribes of Israel that were on the west side of Jordan, uh, of the Jordan. And we see Zebulun and Naphtali. You remember back in chapter 4 when Deborah and Barak summoned the troops. Who was the major contributor of troops to that army? It was Naphtali and Zebulun. So we've got uh, some people of Zebulun and Naphtali. This is probably another generation removed from Barak and Deborah. But the, the pride is still instilled in the people, that when a call goes out, uh, they answered. 36. And Gideon said unto God, If thou wilt save Israel by mine hand, as thou hast said. And we're going to see Gideon asking for actually two more signs, if you will. 37. Behold, I will put a fleece of wool in the floor. And if the dew be on the fleece only, and it be dry upon all the earth beside, or around, then shall I know that thou wilt save Israel by mine hand, as thou hast said. Now, a fleece is, is a, a piece of wool that is cut from the sheep in one piece, is, is what a fleece is. So what he's saying is, I'm going to take this piece of wool and I'm going to lay it in the middle of the threshing floor. And I thought that was a bit ironic. Where was it that uh, Gideon was when the Lord first approached to him? It wasn't on the threshing floor. He was down in the wine press uh, rather than on the threshing floor because he was afraid of the Midianites stealing what he had. So, uh, But he's saying here, tonight when the dew comes, uh, make the fleece wet with dew, but the threshing floor all around it is to be dry. And, and that will be the sign that, I am, that you, Lord, are going to deliver the Midianites into mine hand. 38. And it was so, for he rose up early on the morrow and thrust the fleece together. In other words, he squeezed the fleece in his hand and wringed the dew out of the fleece, a bowl full of water and the ground all around was dry. Uh, Gideon, uh, will Gideon be satisfied uh, that the Lord is indeed going to deliver uh, Median into his hand? Well, remember, the flesh is weak. 39. And Gideon said unto God, Let not thine anger be hot against me, and I will speak but this once in other words, but this once more, I'll add, let me prove or test, I pray thee, but this once with the fleece, let it now be dry only upon the fleece, and upon all the ground let there be dew. Now, Lord, tonight I want to lay the piece of wool in the threshing floor, and the opposite happened. The, the fleece, uh, to remain completely dry, and the threshing floor will be wet with dew. And that will be the sign that you are going to deliver the Midianites into mine hand. If you know anything about agriculture and sheep, you know that wool attracts moisture. Uh, anyone who has sheep, it's, it's very easy to get your flock very sick 
if the weather is not good because their fleece is like a sponge, as we saw the, the fleece a minute ago, just absorb the dew. And the, f uh, the sheep can become very ill, and that's the reason they always have to have sheep cots to where you can get them in out of the weather when it's wet. 40 to complete the chapter. And God did so that night, for it was dry upon the fleece only, and there was dew on all the ground, just as Gideon had asked the Lord to give him that sign, he did so. And, you know, God chose this one Gideon uh, to lead Israel, to be the judge. And, you know, he's chosen some that are going to serve him in a very special way in this, the fig tree generation. I'm speaking of his elect. He has chosen them as well. And you elect, I want you to learn from this that, you know, there's nothing wrong with asking God for a proof. He's expecting some big things from you, from us, his election. And there's nothing wrong when you're not sure, ask him. Ask him for a, a proof, if you will, and he'll give it to you. I know he will. He's going to have his two witnesses here on earth uh, as well. And they're going to be pro providing miraculous things, and they're going to be instructing his election as well. But if you're ever not really, really sure, remember Gideon and, and go to your father in prayer and ask him for a proof. And if you're one of his election, he wants you to be successful because it's his will that, that you are out to accomplish, and he'll provide that proof if you ask. Chapter 7, the uh, war with the people of, that had come in to oppress Israel against the Midianites, the Amalekites, and the children of the east. Chapter 7, verse 1. Then Jerubbabel, in other words, Baal will contend or plead, or he, referring to Gideon, fought against Baal, and Baal could do him no harm. Why? Because Baal is a false god. Who is Gideon? And all the people that were with him rose up early and pitched beside the well of Herod, so that the host, or the army, of the Midianites were on the north side of them, by the hill of Moray, in the valley, in the valley, of course, being the valley uh, Jezreel. Uh, we're going to learn, too, that, uh, that the armies of Israel came to a total of 32,000. Uh, we're also going to learn in the next several verses that the armies of the Midianites and their allies were 135,000. So Israel's outnumbered uh, greater than 4 to 1. Uh, that's still way too many people of Israel, though uh, God has a much lower number uh, for the armies of Israel in mind. Verse 2, And the Lord said unto Gideon, The people that are with thee are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands, lest Israel vaunt themselves against me. Check out this word, vaunt in your Strong's Concordance. The Hebrew word is pa'ar, and it means to boast. In other words, to boast, saying that it was by their own power, the armies of Israel, that the Midianites were defeated, not by the power of God. Saying, mine own hand hath saved me, and typical uh, for man, trying always to come up with their own salvation. It, it began as early as Genesis uh, chapter 11 with the Tower of Babylon. Uh, a couple of hundred years after the flood of Noah's time, the people decided, well, if there's another flood, we will have this tower here where we can just climb the stairway to heaven and save our own necks, uh, creating our own salvation. Uh, today, unfortunately, people still try to create their own salvation. When God sacrificed His Son on the cross for our sins, that salvation is there. All we have to do is believe and accept it. But instead, we come up with 
security blankets such as the rapture theory. Uh, where it's going to be too rough for us here. We're going to fly away. Nobody's going to be here. The, the church during the tribulation, that's false teaching. But that's always seems to be always the way with man, too, is when things go well and we're successful, we say, look what I did. But whenever things are not going so well, we tend to say, God, why did you do this to me? Verse 3. Now, therefore, go to, proclaim in the ears of the people, saying, Whosoever is fearful and afraid, let him return and depart early from Mount Gilead. Smith's Bible Dictionary makes a note that this should have been translated Mount Gilboa. Gilead is on the east side of Jordan. I think this is a copyist error. And there returned of the people twenty and two thousand and there remain 10,000. So what's happened here? And this is according to the law, uh, the, the rules of engagement. You can read in Deuteronomy uh, chapter 20. And in verse 8, it states that if any of your troops are faint of heart, in other words, they're cowardly, send them away. You don't want cowards in with good fighting men. Why? Because they'll turn the hearts of the good fighting men and women, I'll add in this time frame, and, and away from, and from, and from being courageous, and they'll be cowards as well. So here we had a total of 32,000 of Israel, two-thirds of them when they said, is anybody here afraid? They said, yeah, I'm kind of scared. So away they went home. We we're down to 10,000. Uh, to go up against 135,000 of the Midianites, Amalekites, and the children of the East. Guess what? That's still way too many for God to make the point that he wishes to make here. Verse 4, And the Lord said unto Gideon, The people are yet too many. Bring them down unto the water, and I will try them for thee there. And it shall be that of whom I say unto thee, This shall go with thee, and the same shall go with thee. And whomso of whomsoever I say unto thee, This shall not go with thee, the same shall not go. Now this word try in the Hebrew language is tsaraf, and it means to refine. And that's what God is doing here. He's to refine, if you're going to refine silver, what do you do? Well, you heat the metal up until where the worthless part separates from the silver. Uh, and then the slag or dross, whichever you want to call it, is drawn off. So by refining, you're purifying. And that's what God is doing here. He's saying, okay, Gideon, I'm going to choose who goes with you to fight against Median and who doesn't go with you. You know, God knows the hearts of, of, and the minds of all of these men as well. And if, if God chooses three to go up against the hundred, it doesn't matter if it's 135,000 or 135 million. If God is with those three or with those 300, whatever the number be, they're going to be victorious. They're going to have the victory, verse 5. So he, this being Gideon, brought down the people, uh, what was left, the 10,000, unto the water. This would be the fountain or the well of Herod that we read about in verse 1. And the Lord said unto Gideon, Every one that lappeth of the water with his tongue, as a dog lappeth, him shall thou set by himself. In other words, those who bend down to the water and scoop up a cup full of water in their hand and then stand back up and then lapse the water as a dog would lap up water, they I want separated over onto this side. But all the rest of the people bowed down upon their knees to drink. No, excuse me, I went to the wrong verse. Likewise, everyone that boweth down upon his knees to drink. In other words, those who uh, had been used to bowing down to worship Baal 
uh, were going to be used to bowing down to drink water, uh, some scholars uh, think. Anyway, the Lord is deciding, get it, who, who goes and who doesn't go. Verse 6. And the number of them that lapped, putting their hand to their mouth, were three hundred men. But all the rest of the people bowed down upon their knees to drink water. Nine thousand seven hundred of them are going to be uh, refined out of the picture. You see, if even ten thousand of Israel had gone up against the Midianites, there still would have been room for them to say, we did this by our own power. With 300 going up against 135,000, there is no way even the most egotistical man would say, look what I did. He would have to understand that it was the power of God Almighty, the Spirit of God that was causing this victory to take place. Do you know what the number 300 is in biblical numerics? Check it out. It's the strength of the Spirit of Almighty God. And that's the whole point here, beloved, that God wants to get across to His children is that it's not their own strength that's going to deliver them this time. It's His strength, the strength of Almighty God. Verse 7, And the Lord said unto Gideon, by the three hundred men that lapped, will I save you. Note, you're not going to save me as the people of Baal were trying to do. Uh, God saying, I will save you. I would imagine Gideon at this point is pretty thankful that he asked for as many signs as he asked for with the fleece, down to three hundred going up against 135. But remember, the Spirit of God is clothing Gideon at this time. And deliver the Midianites into thine hand, and let all the other people go every man unto his place. 9,700, send them on home. Uh, by the way, tell them to leave their trumpets. We're going to need those, but the rest of you, leave your trumpets, leave us a little bit of food, and we'll handle it from here with God's help. And that's the key in this, that it's the power, the strength of the Spirit of God that is going to deliver Gideon and Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Well, how will the 300 do against the 135,000? Don't miss our next lecture. we got a short message. We'll ask you to listen a moment, won't you please?